there is nothing that has been a better investment of public funds and our time and our energy and our resources than early childhood education. Nothing, not one single thing that we're working on now. Not one thing that we're working on now will make as great a difference. First, I want to uh, thank Rachel uh, Gordon and uh, uh, the uh, Family Impact Seminar for this uh, being their target this year. I've served on the advisory board for several years now, and I was obviously elated when I saw that this was going to be the topic. Uh, I have been in education, this is my 30th year. I was a teacher and a coach. I lost enough games and they made me principal. <laughs> I was principal for a period of time and for 15 years I've been superintendent. And um, I, I've had the opportunity, just a, a, just a tremendous life opportunity to see the best in our ideas and some of the ideas that we've had and, and, and tried to implement in education that just didn't do really that well. And uh, it's been, uh, for me, uh, partially because I've got, got to witness firsthand how important it is for our public policy to intervene for those who are the most at risk in our society and, and get those children into programs uh, that will help them for their lifetime. And we have data that backs it up. This is one of those things that we know works. Very recently, I was with uh, a group of freshman legislators in the city of Chicago, the Ounce of Prevention Fund, another fabulous organization, along with SESI's organization uh, and, and Voices and, and several others. They, they held a seminar for freshman legislators. And I was to just to say a few words about early childhood education and obviously trying to get them early on to understand the importance and get them on board. And, and really what I said is what my message is still today. In the 30 years I've been in education, I've seen a lot of ideas. I, I, we're in the middle of some uh, turbulent times in Illinois now related to reform. How can we improve education? What will make a difference? Do we need to do something with performance evaluation as it relates to tenure, as it relates to RIF, as it relates to... Uh, I think about all those things. And without hesitation, I could state to those freshman legislators that in my 30 years of education, there is nothing that has been a better investment of public funds and our time and our energy and our resources than early childhood education. Nothing, not one single thing that we're working on now. Not one thing that we're working on now will make as great a difference. So that brings us to 2011 and our budget. It's difficult, even after additional revenue, to balance a budget and to sort priorities and, and separate priorities. I am the minority spokesperson on the Elementary and Secondary Education Appropriations Committee. And the nice thing about uh, Representative Chapel Levia and I is she's on the Democratic side of the aisle, I'm on the Republican side of the aisle. And I think we both recognize the fact that there are very few, if any, zero to five children who carry a Republican or Democratic card around. <laughs> Doesn't make any difference. We're supposed to work together for, for children and make those our priority. So as we look this year as, at a difficult budget, I think we have to redouble our efforts, and you are all part of that. You are all part of that. This, this works best when you get involved. We have to redouble our efforts to make sure that we invest those scarce resources where they're most important. And, and you need to let those who represent you in Springfield know that as well, because it is going to get tough, and we're going to be working on how every dollar uh, will be distributed. I appreciate again being here. And before I leave, I do want to say one other thing. And I, I don't want to miss an opportunity. I'm not sure how many opportunities I'll have to share uh, an agenda or a program uh, with uh, Kay Henderson. But uh, Kay has been at the State Board of Education uh, as the uh, person who has shepherded the early childhood program uh, through Illinois for many, many, many years. And uh, she has announced that at June 30th, she is going to uh, retire. Yeah. But I want, I want to just say publicly what a difference you've made. And if you multiply that difference by the number of children who have had the benefit of quality early childhood programs, you can take into your retirement this really long train behind you uh, of, of success. So congratulations on that. Thank you. And thank you again for inviting me.
Thank you, Representative Eddy. Um, as uh, he already said, I'm going to introduce the panel here today, and this is Kay Henderson, um, who is the Division Administrator at the Early Childhood Education Illinois State Board of Education. Um, next to her is Pat Chamberlain, who is the Linguistic and Cultural Diversity Committee of the Illinois State Board of Education, and Susan Sokolinski, who is an elementary school teacher and who is a PhD candidate at Northern Illinois University. Uh, we're gonna try to keep the panel uh, brief so that we have time for questions, but we'll start off with Kay Henderson. Do you want me to move this? Yes, Maybe. thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank you, um, Representative Eddie, for those incredibly generous and kind words. Um, that I am not by nature a bureaucrat, um, but I found a place to be an advocrat, and that was a very good thing for 20 years to have been a part of this program and to have almost brought it up, to watch it grow, to work with others, to nurture it along, um, has, has been far more than I could have ever expected when I came to the State Board of Education, so um, it's wonderful. Um, I do want to um, take the opportunity here. Um, I do this a lot, so it's not just because I'm um, leaving the State Board of Education at the end of this fiscal year, but I want to remind us to look back at where we have been and where we have come from in Illinois with early childhood, and that will point to the reason, I think, for our greatness and our endurance. It started in 1985 um, with a comprehensive school reform and um, a panel that was appointed by then governor, I believe, um, Jim Edgar, or possibly Thompson, I don't know, Ceci, you would know that, <laughs> who was governor in 1985. Um, Thompson. Thompson. Thompson, Thompson, all right then, thank you. Um, um, to, to study um, and put together a recommendation for a pre-kindergarten program, a state-funded preschool program, um, that would target children who are at risk of school failure and, um, again, the other parts of this comprehensive reform um, to address um, children who were at risk included full day kindergarten and other supports for children as they moved on through the early years in their um, public education. Um, at that same time, and by no coincidence, all of the research on um, brain growth and development, particularly in young children, was becoming sort of common wisdom. Um, and so, um, fueled by that research, this blue ribbon panel, um, made up of many of Illinois' incredible giants in early childhood, um, and just in case you would think that though we retire, we go away, forget that. Um, we had Lillian Katz, um, Barbara Bowman, who, both who are um, still incredibly involved in early childhood. Um, Bud, Kat, or Bud Spodak from the University of Illinois, who is a kindergarten expert and contributed um, all of their time along with countless other faculty members from two and four year institutions across the state, school district, folks, um, early childhood specialists, um, and together, put together a report um, and recommendations for state funding for a preschool program that started with a brand new teaching certificate um, that was targeting specifically training for teachers um, who would be working with children birth through age eight. And that certificate came um, into being at, a, at the same time that the first year of funding for our pre-kindergarten program, our state pre-kindergarten program did. We started out with t um, $12 million in um, 1986. Three million of that was used for professional development for the teachers who were already in place and, grand and um, had certain qualifications, um, but basically it paid their tuition to go back to school to earn the early childhood teaching certificate. And so from that $9 million really programmatic piece um, until our height in 2009, um, we went from basically $9 million to $382 million in our state-funded preschool programs, which is such an incredible investment and, and vote of trust um, and belief in the, um, in the worth of these programs and the value of these programs, particularly for our most at-risk young children and their families. 
Along the way, we did all the right things. We started with a really good plan that focused on quality. We required certified teachers. We had um, maximum number of children um, in the classroom so that we couldn't start stacking those little kids up um, one on top of the other. We have a, a teacher um, to child ratio that is consistent with the National Association for the Education of Young Children. We require parent involvement in every single one of these programs on a continuum for parents. Um, we have included funding for professional development um, because we know that that teachers like young children go to college and they get the degree, but they need the extra supports to keep current, to keep enthusiastic, um, to come together and share ideas. And so all of those pieces have been a part of the requirements for our state preschool program, and that's what's made it strong, and that's what's made it endure. Along the way, we have also um, gathered recognition from the National Institute of Early Education Research, um, who has consistently in the last, um, what, maybe six years now that they have published a yearbook that sort of ranks state-funded preschool programs, pretty much pits us one against the other. Um, and Illinois, out of the 10 quality indicators, um, always gets an A. Um, we, we meet nine of them. The tenth is that we provide, that we require it, that a meal be provided. Um, many of our programs are half-day programs. We don't have that as a requirement, although most of our programs do provide a breakfast or a lunch. Um, but since it's not in statute or in our administrative rules, we cannot force near to just give us that extra point. Um, but we'll take the nine. Um, in addition to this, we have remained flexible all along and um, able to respond to um, the population shifts that we see across the state, the need that we see across the state. Um, and this has been um, a good example of that. And I think the most recent example, and again, one that caught national headlines, was um, our focus now on earlier identification of children who come from homes where English is not the primary language and providing those children with appropriate bilingual and dual language services as early as preschool. Um, we, had, we could not have done this, obviously, um, despite all of our great planning, um, without the incredible support of the General Assembly. And that probably um, most certainly would not have happened without our incredible advocacy in Illinois who always makes it a point to keep everyone involved, to keep everyone engaged, and to get the information out there to folks who can really make a difference for us. Um, we have a great early childhood community in this state. I think that um, possibly our, our motto ought to be, don't just do something, stand there, um, because we do stand there. Many of us are, are getting to be um, looking at possibly changing um, lanes a little bit in early childhood, but um, I'm thinking that no one is ever going to actually put this aside and go on to sell real estate or something. Nothing could be that exciting. I think that the, um, what, the other thing that is important for us to remember um, in Illinois is that in terms of the first, we've always been looking at new frontiers. Currently, obviously, we're um, facing some challenging funding issues. We do have the data to back up um, the outcomes for children who have participated in our state-funded preschool program. We also have a unique funding um, strategy for birth to three services where we focus on serving the most at-risk children or families with children in the birth to three age range with intensive services. And this year um, coming up in FY12, we will be actually enrolling those children in our student identification system so that we will have that continuum then from our birth to three program to our three to five program and then on into the K-12. And it's going to make our database that much richer and um, provide for a lot of really good um, um, study and research with that. I think that while we maintain the high quality of our programs um, and, and, and protect um, our children in our early childhood programs from the push down mentality of um, higher stakes and, and higher goals in the K-12 system, um, the, the really important thing for us to be focusing on in addition is really a push up of these good practices of early childhood into kindergarten, first, second, and third grade. 
And I know that that's an undergarment, and we have that joke in early childhood because we are mostly women, but we do think that push-up is a really good idea. <laughs> and um, um, a, f a number of years ago, we had the opportunity to, um, to fund a project with some faculty at Southern Illinois University where we worked with a bunch of school districts down there and actually um, implemented a program where um, those school districts who agreed to be a part of it dedicated time for their teaching staff in preschool through third grade as well as their administrative um, um, leaders and really studied developmentally appropriate practice and then put it into action in their school districts. They aligned their curriculum, their instruction, their assessment practices all the way from preschool through grade three. Um, and the outcomes were incredible for children. They were incredible for parents who didn't um, have children coming home stressed out because they had to learn different rules from different teachers and, you know, the, I, when you need to go to the bathroom in this class, you do this, and when you need to go in this class, you do this. Um, it made a huge difference, and, and that really hadn't even gotten to, um, in many cases, a lot of the instructional pieces. So we know that that kind of an alignment is going to have nothing but positive effects in young children. We've already, it's well researched in early childhood, and NACI defines early childhood as a period in a child's life between birth and age eight. And we need to be taking the lead in implementing that in our public school programs. Thank you very much. Testing. Okay. I had a I did a webinar, webinar the other day and I had microphone issues, so I'm scared of microphones now. <clears throat> but apparently it worked out all right. Somebody told me that. Uh, listen, um, I would like to I I'd like to just hit a couple high points when we're talking about English language learners in early um, early education settings. We really are to look, looking at a, um, a group of children that are bringing an incredible resource to our state and to our country, and we really are looking at kids that, if all goes well, will become bilingual and biliterate and be able to contribute um, richly to our, um, our next generation in terms of education and business and all of the good things that are, will make our society uh, rich and wonderful. So I'll start with that and say that when we're looking at um, working with English language learners in, in our classroom setting, uh, we really, in, in looking at play, we're really looking at how can we maximize our kids' strengths in order to use both languages in order to enrich their play. And there's lots of different kinds of play, obviously. There's constructive play, there's object play, there's block play. But t I'd like to sort of focus in on what I call mature play or complex sociodramatic play. We're looking at play at its highest level in terms of getting the most benefit for our children in um, in terms of executive functioning, in terms of collaboration, all of those things that Kathy was talking about earlier. So when we're thinking about if I, let's take a case where a child comes to school, speaks another language at home and doesn't speak English at all in school, um, or doesn't speak English, but English is the language of the school. And their job is to play, um, they're gonna go and play airport. Um, and their job is to be the mechanic in the airport. Okay, they will have to um, use a lot of executive functioning skills in order to use to do that role, won't they? They'll need to be able to regulate themselves to go over to the right area to be uh, to be able to play the mechanic. They're going to have to be able to understand how to interact with other children in order to collaborate to fix the airplane. And they're gonna sometimes maybe have to tell other people what to do, that other regulation that we love so well in early childhood and that our little, you know those girls, who are they, that love that other regulation, right? So if we think about language proficiency and overlay that on top of the executive functioning issues, think about if children only have a few words in order to play, they're going to not be able to 
reach higher levels of play, will they? So they're going to need to learn vocabulary for what the roles are, but they are also going to have to need, know the language in order to be able to play what the mechanic plays. And they need to learn language in English, but they may also, in many of your um, situations, have other children that share their first language. So they can do that in both their first language and learn it in their second language as well. So when they're learning self-regulation and other regulation, our jobs as teachers is to help them learn the scripts, as it were, to help them understand the language that is needed in order to play the mechanic or in order to get somebody to come over with the right tool in order to um, help them fix the airplane. And they can do that in both languages. We know that families from around the world value play. Play and pretend play is a cross-cultural uh, phenomenon. And so that all of our children have, have families that value play. Now poverty and some other issues, life issues may impact how that gets played out at home, but very often, um, I had a, um, a parent educator told me a story one time where she, was, she went into a, um, a household and she brought, um, she brought some blocks one time and she was showing parents what to do with blocks and introducing some guys and they would create some scenarios and she came back the next week and the mother said, oh my gosh, she had taken all these pictures and she was doing, this was a Spanish speaking mom and she was doing this all in Spanish and they, were, they had such a good time playing and she said, I got to know my daughter in a whole different way. The next week they left some, um, art, some art materials, some Play-Doh and things and so she came back the next week and, and she said, oh my gosh, and there, the uh, refrigerator was plastered plastered with all kinds of pictures and art um, drawings and um, tempera paints, all kinds of things. And the third week she came back and the mother was just crying and she said, I didn't know I was supposed to be doing all these things with my child. And she said, you know, the teacher said I should only speak English and I can't do all of this in English. And so when that, that home, that parent educator gave that mom permission to play and to develop those wonderful um, executive functioning skills in her child's first language, she became much more ready for school than um, somebody, that, the mom that was drilling her daughter in alphabet English flashcards. So we have to help parents understand how critical that underlying self-regulation piece is. The second issue related to language proficiency and play and, and executive functioning has to do with working memory. If any of you have tried to learn a second language and do another thing at the same time, you understand how much tax there is on your memory to remember all the words you're supposed to say and then how to put them together and how to do what you're trying to get done. So there's a lot of um, cognitive energy that is required in terms of um, just memory issues. And so when kids are at play, they get a lot of opportunity to practice in low stress, highly engaging ways with peers that will scaffold for them. So if you have um, kids will, I work with kids all the time and they look at me and they, they say, oh, you're an English speaker and so they talk to me in English and then I say, no, pero hablo español and they're looking at me like, really? Why, I, should I really be talking to you in Spanish? And then finally they'll say, oh, if I play long enough, they give it up and say, okay, yeah, you're fun, I'll play with you. And so that whole issue of being able to um, regulate your, your thinking and your language based on who's around you, that's another whole piece of um, required to use your memory and also your cognitive flexibility. How much mental energy do I need to um, use for a particular task? And that includes both my language proficiency and my cognitive proficiency and all of the other social emotional pieces. How much do I have to manage in order to um, be able to participate in this particular activity? So sometimes you'll see kids um, when they're in dramatic play, if they're really engaged in dramatic play but they are very, their English is very limited, they might be 
you know, more observing and sitting back but they are still taking in lots of information, they're listening, they're learning, and we want to give kids lots of opportunities to interact by doing some of that explicit instruction that they need for a script or for a particular role or an action in order to be able to do that. Um, and we want to be able to work with and encourage parents to talk about, as Kathy was talking about, about the value of what they are doing and the value that they bring from their lang first language and from their first culture and how that is a gift and that that is something that we really want to develop because it will help them develop executive functioning skills, cognitive skills, language skills which will eventually make them more um, successful in school. Uh, we also, when we're thinking about levels of play and levels of um, sophistication of play, the, um, the tools of the mind work, the Elena Bordrova and Debbie Leong work, they look at um, different levels of play and what I like to call that sort of that mature complex stage, they call stage four, kindergartners get a stage five, um, where there's games with rules and more, and more sophisticated, um, uh, more sophisticated rules. But let's say for preschool stage four, we're really looking at um, what kinds of scenarios could kids play, what roles they're going to play, how do they come up with problems, and how do they resolve those. And those are very linguistically and cultural, culturally bound. So I was in a room the other day where there was a, a birthday party. Um, they were working on, that was their theme, their unit was a birthday party. And um, there was a couple moms over cooking in the kitchen, and um, it, it was a primarily Hispanic classroom. It was on the south side of Chicago, and um, and they they were making um, they were making sopa. They were making some soup, and they threw some jewels in there. And then somebody from all across the room says, "No, we need we need a piñata." And then everybody goes, "Yeah, let's make a piñata." And so the the what happened in that room transformed because lots of kids had that experience and just they sat and decided had a, a sort of a work group to decide how they were going to make a piñata for this um, this party they were going to have and one little girl who had been crying for the, about the first 15 minutes of the day was finally had calmed down and sat and was sitting and watching all this and she went over and got some beads to make necklaces to put inside the piñata. And she then became very engaged in that dramatic play. That's the power of high level um, problem solving and problem orientation that we um, want to see in our early childhood classrooms. Of course, if you do not have the resources to um, use a second language or use the children's first language in school. You want to, of course, nurture it at home. But you also need to then use English as a second language techniques in terms of looking at lots of repetitions in meaningful context, lots of visuals. You know all these things. We do them anyway in, in early childhood classes. But we also have to help um, English-speaking kids learn how to be brokers for um, initiating conversations. How do we get kids to be able to slow their speech down, to repeat, to initiate play with kids who are playing in their second language, and that's a new language? How do we get them to use that um, and to make alliances and make friends across those language barriers? It doesn't happen automatically with all kids. It's something we as teachers need to scaffold and address explicitly in our teaching. And finally, um, do I have time? Okay. <laughs> finally, um, I want to address that um, I'm an assessment person. So um, one of the things that we do, we're so good in early childhood at looking at children and collecting data anecdotally for their portfolios, for um, looking at where we're going to scaffold, looking, collecting assessment information to where to scaffold just that next level. And sometimes if we look at children and look at their functioning just in English in their play, we might misinterpret what some of their abilities are, and they're certainly in terms of their cognitive abilities. So we want to be very, very, very careful 
because I'll put on my special ed hat, we want to be very careful not to misidentify children who are learning a second language as selectively mute, um, which is a, a very common ter term these days, or children with some uh, cognitive disabilities because they aren't able to play in a complex, mature way in their second language. You need to be able to give kids the opportunity to do it in two languages, if at all possible, in order to be able to do that. And there are certainly um, models of, like Tony Linder's play-based assessment allows use of two languages. And so we, but we really, really need to make sure that when we're reporting and looking at assessment, we're reporting that information about their level of play in making sure that we identify which language we see these things happening in. And obviously, being able to help parents understand where their children are and be able to support them in growing their skills through play and using their um, native language and their cultural background will only enrich all of our preschool children and our school districts and our society as a whole. Thank you. I can see the watch going over there, <laughs> so I'm going to cut right to the chase. My name is Sue Sakolinski, and I appreciate an opportunity to be here with all of you today. I am here to advocate for the children of Illinois, and I am especially interested in, in, in advocating for those children who fall in the upper range of the early childhood group, and those are the children in second and third grade. Um, and, and Representative Eddie, I, I, I urge you to expand that, you know, zero to five, okay, into zero to eight. Um, these children are, are struggling. Uh, several of our previous speakers today have noted that recesses are being increasingly abandoned by Illinois teachers who are desperately trying to race to the top in order that they do not leave any children behind. <laughs> um, these teachers are well, me are well intentioned, well meaning individuals who are being intimidated, and I would use a strong word here. Um, many of us feel bullied by some of the pressures that are being um, put upon us and our children. Um, I myself have, have two very young grandchildren, and I'm here today to talk about um, a wonderful program and approach to promoting early literacy called the Daily Five. Now, the first gift I gave to my granddaughter, Lily, who's now 26 months old, is a book, and I, I had that book wrapped and ready for her the day she came home from the hospital. And I read that book to her, and I was reading that book to her, and my daughter laughed at me and said, Mom, why are you reading a book to a baby that age? She doesn't understand anything. And so I explained to my daughter, I actually referred to the Hart and Risley study about how important that language is and that actually by the time a baby is born, that baby has an actual 12 weeks of listening experiences. And that's where literacy starts. Literacy is founded in speaking and in listening. And my daughter's reply after listening to some of my, the information I shared with her from my literacy perspective was, how would I know that if you weren't my mom? And so I published an article in the Illinois Reading Council communicator titled, How Would I Know That If You Weren't My Mom? So it's so important to share information with parents who really want to promote their children's literacy development. Every parent wants their child to read, and I believe that every child can read. Now, the Daily Five was developed by two sisters who, who believe that children can take responsibility for their literacy learning. And this is a little book. I encourage all of you to get it, whether you teach uh, preschool age children or elementary age children, this is a structure 
for teaching your literacy block. And Representative Eddie, I'm, I'm going to use some jargon and I'm going to do my best to explain it. The literacy block is simply a block of time during the day that we focus on the language arts. Now those language arts should be integrated with science and math and social studies, but the focus is, is to, to promote those foundational literacy capabilities including listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Um, these two sisters have put together a program that they actually show you in some DVDs. Um, I just want to talk to you, um, if you could please help me with these posters. Children who learn the Daily Five learn how to read to self. We used to call that drop everything and read or um, silent sustained reading time. Well, what the sisters contend, and I certainly agree, is that too often we ask children to do something without teaching them how to do it. Now, these posters are beautiful. The ones hanging in my room that I didn't really want to crawl up on the wall and get down um, look more put together by myself than my students. But if you notice at the bottom of every one of these posters on the student side is what? Have fun, okay, that's what Daily Five is all about. If, so when kids are reading to themselves, they have, they have choice in what they read. Okay, um, next we have work on writing. And notice, okay, in the Daily Five, kids aren't necessarily writing at their desks and tables, they're writing together. They're cooperating, they're using that language. They might be writing under tables or under desks or spread out on the floor. If you can go to the next one, please. Okay, the next one is reading with someone and here is where we can really get playful. Kids who are reading with someone can read reader's theater style and they're picking roles. And they're, and, and they're narrating, and they're cooperating. And Reader's Theater, you bet, it's very, very playful. Okay, next one. All right, and the one I just wanted to really focus on for a few minutes today are how kids who are um, operating in the Daily Five model can work on words. Okay, I have, as most teachers do, a big span of capabilities in my classroom. So for kids, and I'm not using their real names certainly, like Bobby and Susie and Jennifer who are reading, yes, I have second graders in my class who are reading at a seventh grade reading level. They are interested in games like this, synonym bingo, okay? I have kids in my class who are very emergent readers. They're playing games like letter flip. So there is a place for play in second and third grade, and the Daily Five is a wonderful structure that takes teachers step by step how to teach children how to be independent with their lit literacy learning. Um, one last comment I do want to make. Um, several people have disclosed today that they're poor test takers. I'm a terrible standardized test taker. 17 years ago, I cried my eyes out when I learned that I had failed the Praxis test at NIU by two points. I couldn't do my undergraduate study. I, I'm an, a non-traditional student. By the time I became a teacher, I was 42 years old and had three elementary aged children of my own. So I failed that test. Okay, fortunately, another university in Illinois was willing to take a chance on me. Today, I'm a doc student. I have a literacy program called Literacy and Fam, a family literacy program called Family in, Literacy in Families Empowers, and I teach graduate courses for NIU. <laughs> so, thank you very much. I know most of you are um, pre-K teachers, but but please advocate also for the kids at the upper end of our early childhood range who are in um, pretty desperate need these days of being rescued and giving, being given time to be children. Thank you so much.
Right. We are committed to getting everyone out of here by noon. So unfortunately, I think that we will not have time for questions, but I know the panelists would be happy to stick around and chat with anyone who'd like to talk in more detail. On behalf of the Institute of Government and Public Affairs, as well as Illinois Action for Children, I'd like to thank you so much for spending the morning with us. I'd like to thank our keynote speaker, Kathy hirsch Pesek, for such a fantastic talk. As well as representatives Linda Chapalavia and Roger Eddy for coming in today. And our three very wonderful panelists. Thank you so much for your time and please be safe getting home. Enjoy the weather.